Okay, let's see what you guys think. Question one. Why does Macbeth kill Macduff's family? Is it a good idea? Why, why not? A few groups took this question and they all agree that Macbeth kills Macduff's family because he wants to scare Macduff. He wants to um, convince Macduff not to fight against him. And if this is his main reason, it's a pretty bad reason. Because it turns out, once Macduff's family dies, he gets really angry and he wants to fight Macbeth even more. So it backfired. But there's another possible reason that Macbeth himself says in the play. Let's look at this, 41150. This is page 1282. 150. This is Macbeth talking. Macbeth. The castle of Macduff I will surprise. Seize upon Fife. Fife is the location. Give to the of sword. The edge of the sword, so basically kill his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. The word line here means bloodline. So all of the family, all of the children. And this points to the fact that this society is a feudal society, which means everybody is related to everybody else. So if Macbeth does not have children, then after he dies, somebody else's children becomes king. So maybe Macbeth is also trying to prevent Macduff's children from becoming king. Could be both. Uh, in the event, this just makes Macduff, Macduff want to fight more against Macbeth. So the second reason makes a bit more sense than the first reason. But one group also pointed out that because Macbeth has no children, no matter how many people he kills, once he dies, the next king will not be from his direct family. So there really is no point, no benefit to himself to killing Macduff's children. The only benefit would be uh, the king would go to somebody else, not Macduff's family. Does he hate Macduff that much? Or maybe Macbeth uh, would prefer that nobody become king after he dies. We'll get back to this point. This point is related to question five. Number two, is Macduff a traitor? Uh, this is also a popular question. Some groups said yes, some groups said no. Everybody agreed there's not a clear answer. And let us look at why. Act 4, scene 2, line 83. Okay, so here the first murderer says to Macduff's son, he's a traitor. But earlier on the left, this is what line is this? 37, 8, 9, 41, 2, 3, 4, 45. Uh, Macduff's son asks his mother, Was my father a traitor, mother? Lady Macduff says, I, that he was. So, yes, he was a traitor. Son, what is a traitor? Mac Lady Macduff, why? One that swears and lies. So, the word why is not a question, it's an uh, interjection, it's an expletive. Um, so, who is a traitor? 
someone who makes a promise and then breaks the promise. Uh, in this case, Lady Macduff is talking about their marriage promise. It looks like Macduff ran away and left his wife and children behind. And in that case, he would be a traitor to their marriage. But this idea of making a promise and breaking it. Macduff made a promise to follow the king. But once the king became Macbeth, he broke the promise. So technically he is a traitor, but many groups I talked to, I think everybody agreed that he hopes to improve Scotland. He loves his country more than his king. So in that sense, he's a traitor in a good way. Is that possible? The thing is, in this play, Macbeth is a bad king. After he becomes king, Scotland gets worse and worse. The people are suffering. And everybody has questions about how Duncan died. No proof, but many questions. But is that enough to justify fighting against your own king? And when you call Macduff a traitor or not a traitor, are you supporting Macbeth? Are you supporting Malcolm? Are you even supporting Macduff? So you can see that the point of this question is not, is Macduff a traitor? The point is that the question carries so much weight. It's such a complicated situation. If you find anyone in Scotland and you ask them, do you think Macduff is a traitor? Their answer will tell you about their political beliefs. Or maybe they'll give you a fake answer and try to get you to reveal your political beliefs. Or maybe he will suspect that you are a spy from Macbeth and he will give what he thinks is the correct answer. The point is that Macbeth has created a situation of fear and uncertainty in Scotland. So people are not willing to say exactly what they think. For example, if you look at the previous page, when Ross comes to visit Lady Macduff and to warn her that danger is coming, he says on line 15, for your husband, which means as for your husband, he is noble, wise, judicious. Judicious means prudent, smart in a practical way. And best knows the fits of the season, so he best knows what to do at different times. What is appropriate to do at different times? I dare not speak much further, but cruel are the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. When we hold rumor from what we fear, yet know not what we fear, but float upon a wild and violent sea, each way and none. So these five lines all basically mean everything is confusing. We are traitors and don't know it. We fear something and believe the rumors, even though we're not sure what we fear. And we're all floating on a wild and violent sea, going in every direction and going in no direction. That's exactly the atmosphere that Macbeth has created for Scotland. So, we are traitors and do not know ourselves. We don't even know that we are traitors. That's how confusing the situation is. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll answer the final three questions, and then I will introduce the next play.
I am so hungry. Question three. The question about Macduff passing Malcolm's test. So what is this test? Let's take a look. Four, three, one, oh, three. Page 1285. So up to this point, Macduff has been trying to convince Malcolm to fight against Macbeth. Uh, and Malcolm has kept on saying, I'm not the right person to be king. Uh, and so Malcolm says, uh, so uh, after like Malcolm keeps saying, like, not me, not me, I would be a terrible king. Macduff says, oh, Scotland, Scotland, with a sugalana. Malcolm, if such a one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I have spoken. So I have already said I wouldn't be a good king. So somebody else, if you think you would be a good king, now is the time to speak up. And Macduff says, fit to govern? No, not to live. Oh, nation miserable, with an untitled tyrant, blood sceptered. OK, first of all, the word tyrant. It can mean a bad king. It could also mean a king who is not the son of the previous king. So it is li literally true that Macbeth is not the son of Duncan, so he is technically a tyrant. Untitled means does not have the title of king or rather does not deserve to have the title of king. A scepter, we talked about this last week, is the stick of power that belongs to the king. And so bloody sceptered means that in order to get this power or to keep this power, Macbeth killed a lot of people. When shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? When will you be healthy again? Since that the truest issue of thy throne by his own interdiction stands accursed and does blaspheme his breed. Because the truest issue, issue means children, of thy throne. So this is talking about Malcolm. Malcolm is Duncan's oldest son. So he is the truest he is the best person to be the next king. And yet by his own interdiction, by his own words, his own uh, prohibition of himself. Stands accursed. He curses himself. And does blas uh, blaspheme his breed. He says negative things about his himself and his family. Uh, all of this is what. Malcolm was saying above, he's a bad person, terrible king, etc. Thy royal father was a most sainted king. The queen that bore thee, so your mother, oftener upon her knees than on her feet, died every day she lived. Oftener upon her knees than on her feet. So she prayed so much, she was more praying than standing. That's why he calls uh, the king a sainted king with his queen. Died every day she lived. She worked so hard. She prayed so hard as queen that every day uh, was working and praying herself to death. Fare thee well. Goodbye. These evils thou repeatst upon thyself hath banished me from Scotland. All of these negative things that you're saying about yourself have made me leave my country forever. There is no more hope there. Oh, my breast, my breast means my chest, my heart. Thy hope ends here. So my hope for my country has died here with you. And by saying this, Macduff 
passes Malcolm's test. Macduff basically is saying, you, Malcolm, were the best choice to be the next king. But if you are really such a bad person, and if you really would become a terrible king, and if you are willing to curse yourself and your father and your family, then there is no hope for Scotland. And my hope has died. So what would it look like if Macduff had not passed Malcolm's test? A few groups took this question. Uh, and basically everyone agrees that if Macduff had agreed with Malcolm that, you know what, maybe you're right. You're not the best choice to be king. Maybe someone else could be a better king. That would fail the test. That would show Malcolm that Macduff is not here to do the right thing. He is here to gain power, to follow whoever would become the next king. Instead, Macduff says, if you are not fit to be king, then nobody is fit to be king. And that truly tells Malcolm that his loyalty to Malcolm is not because of Malcolm himself, but in fact his loyalty to Scotland. If the best hope for Scotland has died, then Macduff would follow nobody else. Question four, why is this mostly in prose and not verse? Five one. Nobody took this question, so let's look at it together. So this scene is Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking scene. This is where Lady Macbeth's a uh, waiting woman goes to find a doctor uh, to look at what Lady Macbeth does when she's asleep, right? She walks around, she washes her hands, whatever. This is a very famous soliloquy. Out, damn spot, out, I say. This whole section is very famous. But why is this all in prose? Well, uh, except for the last section. We mentioned in earlier in the semester that usually verse is reserved for important people and important speeches. Prose is given to ordinary people and to comedy, low comedy. Here, Lady Macbeth is important, but she's not actually saying anything. She's dreaming. Her words carry no orders, no authority. She's being looked at as a patient by the doctor. So the play makes it prose to tell you Macbeth, Lady Macbeth has devalued herself by her actions. She plotted with her husband to kill the king, and now she has PTSD because of this. Her actions have devalued her authority. So she doesn't deserve verse. But the second part of the question, why does it end with verse? Why does the doctor get to speak in verse even though he's a common person? Well, first of all, because in this scene, the doctor has the most authority. Now that Lady Macbeth has been devalued and she's dreaming, and she's sleepwalking, sleep talking. The doctor has the most authority. But also, what does he say? Foul whisperings are abroad, which means people are talking bad things about the country. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. So by killing the king, you have brought about even more problems. We talked about this early uh, last week or the week before. Killing the king is unnatural because it means the king died before his old natural death. This unnatural, unnatural trouble means unusual troubles, even more than usual. Infected minds 
to their death pillows will discharge their secrets. Discharge means reveal. More needs she the divine than the physician. She needs a priest more than a doctor. God, God forgive us all. Look after her. So he's talking to God. Take care of Lady Macbeth. Remove from her the means of all annoyance. So means here means cause. Take away the cause of all her troubles. And still keep eyes upon her. Still means always. Asking God to always look after Lady Macbeth. So good night. My mind she has mated and amazed my sight. Mated means matched. I have never seen something like this. My mind is matched. It cannot understand. It cannot overcome. It cannot master. And amazed my sight. I think, but dare not speak. Again, that atmosphere of fear. I think, but dare not speak. So why is this in verse? Because he has authority and he's giving a moral judgment. He's talking about how the evil thing that Lady Macbeth did is causing so many problems for the country and for herself and that only God can save us now. It's a moral judgment. So the play wants to give this more authority and more weight. So it makes it verse. In five, how would you describe Macbeth at 5320 and 5519? Why is he like this? Did he predict this? Why does he keep going? Okay, 5320. Here. So this is right after somebody tells him that the English are attacking. When I behold Satan, I say, this push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. Push means attack. I am uh, right. So let's start here. Uh, this push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. This attack will make me happy forever or will take away my power. So it's a make or break moment, win or lose. I have lived long enough. Whoa, I have lived long enough. My way of life is fallen into the sear, the yellow leaf. So way means road. My road of life is coming to an end. And that which should accompany old age as honor, or as means such as. So things such as honor, love, Obedience, which means loyalty. Troops of friends, which means many friends. I must not look to have, but in their stead, which means instead. Curses. Not loud, but deep. So even though people are not willing to loudly curse him, he can feel the sincerity and intensity of these curses. Mouth honor, which means people talk to him like he's a king, but that's only from the mouth, not from the heart. They don't truly give him honor from the heart. Breath, which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. So whenever they, they talk to him with honor, their heart would deny. Fain just means would want to would want to deny this honor, but they dare not. So people follow him because of fear. And he knows this. And yet at 5-5 five, five, line 20, uh, line 19, this is the most famous soliloquy in a play full of famous soliloquies. This is right after somebody tells him that Lady Macbeth has died. She should have died hereafter, so she died too soon. 
there would have been a time for such a word. Such a word is probably talking about the word hereafter. If she had lived, there would have been a future for her. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. So the idea is day after day after day, slowly one day to the next until the end. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. So he's saying people who expect something else rather than death at the end of life are all fools. Out, out, brief candle. Candle here is talking about life. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. A player is an actor on the stage. To strut is to walk. To fret is to express emotion. And he's saying people only have their hour on stage in life. And then everything is ended. Life is so short. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. So life is a story full of emotion and effect but there is no meaning. It signifies nothing. It's a very pessimistic, nihilistic speech. So going back to the question, the first speech, Macbeth knows that people hate him, but he's going to fight the British anyway. He's going to fight the English anyway. The second speech, he feels like there's no meaning in life. The, the end of life for everybody is death and the, nothing matters in between. Why is he like this? Well, well, as we were talking about in question one, Macbeth has no children. So once he dies, his story has ended. There's nothing left for him or any next generation of his family. And now that Lady Macbeth is dead, he will never have children. So that could be one reason why. So since there is nothing left for his children, if he wants glory and honor, he must have it in his own life. So in fact, that pessimism and nihilism might push him to get even more power before he dies. The second part, uh, sorry, the third part. Do you think that he predicted this situation? Why or why not? I think he, in his heart, he kind of knew, but he didn't think a lot about this. This goes back to last week we were talking about killing Banquo's son. Banquo, according to the prophecy, will not become king, but his son and his son's son and his whole family later will become kings. And it seems like Macbeth only realizes this after he himself becomes king. Even though the three uh, sisters told him, he didn't really pay attention to that part until he himself became king. So maybe it's the same thing. He knows he doesn't have sons. He knows that Banquo's sons will be kings, but he didn't really pay attention to that until he himself is about to die. Or he thinks either win or die. It's possible that he will die soon. And so he begins to think about this situation. What does the future have for me and my family, which is nothing? What have I accomplished for myself? 
which is basically nothing. He's king, but nobody supports him. So did he predict this? Probably not, but he should have. And if he did kind of know what would happen, why did he do it anyway? Maybe because he wanted power so much that he didn't really care about anything else until after he got that power. Then he started thinking. And he realized that it was actually a pretty bad deal for him. OK, do you have questions about these? All right, so next week we are starting the new play, The Tempest, Uh And before next week, please read Act One. It looks like not a lot, right? Act One, only Act One. Well, Act One is the longest act with the most information. Um, it's important to read Act 1 because Act 1 will tell you the whole story. Let me pass out the new handout. OK, so let me give you a brief summary. By the way, uh, last Friday morning, we watched a movie version of this play. If you were not able to make it, the movie is on Moodle. I put it here, Films OneDrive. Uh, and then this video tells you how to add subtitles. So if you want, you can go home and watch the movie version. I do have to warn you, the movie is directed by Derek Jarman. Jarman is notorious for being a very gay filmmaker. So the movie is very, very, very gay. Uh, which may not be the case with the actual play. Depends on how you understand the play. So let's look at the characters and we'll talk about the story. The Tempest begins on an island in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and we begin with the character Prospero. An old man, and it calls him the right Duke of Milan. Right means proper. He should be the Duke of Milan. Milan Gongri. But, you know, right now he's on an island. He is not the actual Duke of Milan. He's on the island with his daughter, Miranda. And his servant or slave, Caliban. Miranda is a teenager, somewhere between 15 and 18. Caliban uh, is actually the original inhabitant of this island. Before um, Prospero and Miranda got here, Caliban was already living here. And it says in many different parts of the play that Caliban is deformed, which means ugly, very ugly. It also calls him savage. So not 
civilized. Of course, today we don't talk about people like this, but you will notice that. Like if you look at the beginning of Macbeth. Here, let me show you. If you look at the beginning of Macbeth, it has this square bracket. Right? And at the end, another square bracket. These square brackets mean that this information was added by the editor. But if you look at the Tempest, there are no square brackets here. The square brackets only appear here. In other words, most of this information was written by Shakespeare. So these descriptions, this character order, most of this was decided by Shakespeare himself. That's why we have Prospero on this side and Miranda on that side. Traditionally, you would separate the men from the women. Also, this is why the main character is Prospero, but he's not the first. Because there's someone of an even higher rank in the story, which would be Alonzo, King of Naples. Alonzo is not the most important, but he is the highest rank, so he comes first. Uh, OK, so on the island you have Prospero, Miranda and Caliban. Um, as Miranda grows into a woman, Prospero decides to tell her how they ended up on this island, the whole backstory. Uh, and this story comes about in Act One. And it's a story about how Prospero was cheated out of his dukedom and now his brother Antonio is currently the Duke of Milan. He is the usurping Duke of Milan. To usurp means to take power illegally. So this is the backstory. What happens during the play? Well, as the title tells you, there is a tempest. And the tempest brings all of these other people to the island. Uh, it looks like they're shipwrecked, I mean, and they end up on the island. And it just so happens that all of these people are Prospero's enemies. And Prospero is a sorcerer. He knows some magic. That's how he controls Caliban. And he also controls Ariel. Ariel is a man. Uh, a spirit, Jingling. Uh, and so by using magic, Prospero orders Ariel to do his work, to like have fun, to play with these people. Uh, and he also controls Caliban against Caliban's will. And so the story is about how Prospero takes revenge on these people. But also, Ferdinand son to the king of Naples, falls in love with Miranda, and Miranda falls in love with him. So that makes things a bit more complicated. And finally, I should remind you that this is not a tragedy. It ends on a happy note. But it's not exactly a comedy either, because there's lots of magic and lots of revenge and stuff. So scholars have had some trouble deciding what to call this kind of play. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear this is a fantasy play. Um, yeah, so the play begins with the shipwreck. And then in Act 1, Scene 2, Prospero explains his story to Miranda. OK, questions? This is one of Shakespeare's later plays. You can think about Shakespeare as an old man telling this story. He's not very old, like 30 something, but relatively older man telling this story. OK, so please finish Act One before next week.
Uh, OK, so we have a little more time left. Let's take a look at the beginning of this play. Act one, scene one. Uh, <laughs> a pun, Shuang Guan Yu. A tempestuous noise. You get it? Because it's called the tempest. It's a tempestuous noise. Anyway, of thunder and lightning heard. Enter a shipmaster and a botson. So these are people sailing the ship. Uh, master, botson, botson. Here, master, what cheer? So what do you want? Master, good. Speak to the, mar uh, to the mariners, to the sailors. Fall to it yearly, or we run ourselves aground. Bestir, bestir. So it's in the middle of a storm, and they're fighting to keep their ship from sinking. How would you do this on stage? It should be an indoor stage. It could also be an outdoor stage if you want, but it, at this point in history, it was more likely an indoor stage. So how would you show a shipwreck on stage in the 16th, 17th century? I was very lucky to see this play in London a few years ago. Uh, and it was also done in a big indoor stage. And what they did was they used lighting to. OK, so the, the stage itself was built like the inside of a ship. Or the inside of a shipwreck, if you want. And to show the storm and the seas, they used sound, of course, but they also used lighting like they projected uh, water images onto the stage and people were running around the stage shouting here shouting there things were being thrown and being tossed and falling general chaos and so we got the idea that things were very dangerous and that the ship was about to sink so that's one way to do it uh, i'm gonna skip this scene because basically the point is they have a shipwreck here, all lost to prayers, to prayers, all lost. Uh, and then basically they sink. Let's all sink with the king. OK, next page, act one, scene two. Enter Prospero in his magic cloak. And Miranda. Uh, cloak, why Palma? something like that. Miranda, if by your art, which means your skill, my dearest father, you have put the wild waters in this roar. So if you have caused this storm, allay them, like uh, settle them down, stop the storm. The sky, it seems, would pour down stinking pitch. Pitch is black tar like uh, dirty water, black water. But that, which means except for the fact that the sea mounting to the welkin's cheek dashes the fire out. So this means it looks like the ship would be destroyed by the sky, except that the sea is even worse than the sky. Oh, I have suffered with those that I saw suffer. A brave vessel, vessel here means ship, who had no doubt some noble creature in her, a noble person, dashed all to pieces. Oh, the cry, so they're shouting, did knock against my very heart. Poor souls, they perished, they died. We still use this word today. Perish means to die, or sometimes it means to expire, like food. When food goes bad, we can say that it has perished. Had I been any god of power, I would have sunk the sea within the earth, or ere it should the good ship so have swallowed. So I would have calmed down the sea before the sea uh, swallowed the good ship. 
and the souls within her, everybody on uh, in the ship. Freight is what you put on a ship. So freighting souls just means everybody who is on the ship. So from here we can see what kind of person Miranda is. Very kind, very loving, very peaceful young lady. Crossborough. Be collected. In English today we say collect yourself. So like calm down, bring yourself, pull yourself together. Right, calm down. No more amazement. Tell your piteous heart there's no harm done. So no more amazement means I will stop the storm. Piteous does not mean pitiful. Pitiful means like pathetic, kabeda. Piteous means full of pity. There's no harm done. Miranda, oh, woe the day. Like what a terrible day. Prospero, no harm. I have done nothing but in care of thee. So everything I do has been for you. Of thee, my dear one, thee, my daughter. Who art ignorant of what thou art. So you are ignorant of what you are. You don't know who you are. You don't know your background, basically. You don't know your origin. Not knowing of whence I am. So you don't know where I come from. Nor that I am more better than Prospero, master of a full poor cell, and thine no greater father. So you don't know that I am much better than simply Prospero, master of a small magical room, and better than simply your father. Uh, throughout the play, Prospero will talk about his cell. A cell is just a small room. Miranda, more to know did never meddle with my thoughts. So I never thought that there would be more to your story. I'd never thought you were more than my father. Prospero, tis time I should inform thee farther. I'll tell you more. Lend thy hand and pluck my magic garment from me. So help me take off my magic cloak. So laying down his magic cloak and staff. Mozang. Lie there my art. So she is his daughter. So he kind of created her. So he calls her my art. Wipe thou thine eyes. So wipe away your tears. Have comfort. The direful spectacle of the wreck Direful means full of danger. Which touched the very virtue of compassion in thee. So this view moved your compassion in you. It showed how compassionate you are. This uh, spectacle, this, this show, this vision. I have with such provision in mine art so safely ordered. So. I have used all of my skill to make it safe so that there is no soul, no, not so much perdition as an hair betid to any creature in the vessel which thou heardst cry, which thou sawst sink. So not a soul, not a hair suffered or died. Perdition is to go to hell. So nobody died. Uh, none of any creature in the vessel. Betid today we say betide with an E at the end, and it just means happened to. N uh, suffering, death, none of that happened to anybody in the ship. None of those people you heard shout. None of those people you saw sink. None of that happened. It's all magic. Sit down, for thou must now know farther. So I'm going to tell you more. Miranda, sitting. You have often begun to tell me what I am, but stopped and left me to a bootless inquisition. 
Bootless means in vain, useless, no result. Concluding, stay, not yet. Stay just means wait. So she's saying, you've tried to tell me before, but every time I've asked, you said, the time has not yet come. Prospero, the hours now come. The very minute bids thee ope thine ear. Ope means open. So the time is now. Listen. Obey and be attentive. Canst thou remember a time before we came unto this cell? I do not think thou canst, for then thou wast not out three years old. So do you remember anything before we came here? I don't think so, because you were barely three years old. Miranda. Certainly, sir, I can. Prospero. By what? What do you remember? By any other house or person? Of anything the image, tell me, that has kept with thy remembrance. Tell me what you remember. Miranda. Tis far off and rather like a dream than an assurance that my remembrance warrants. It was long ago. My memory is not sure. It's more like a dream than a memory. Warrant means guarantee. So I can't tell you that my memory guarantees it was true. It was more like a dream. Had I not four or five women once that tended me, that look after me, Thou hadst, and more, Miranda. But how is it that this lives in thy mind? What seest thou else in the dark backward and abysm of time? What else do you see when you look backward in time? And it says that time is dark. Abysm. Today we call this the abyss. Which is a, a deep hole or a deep cliff. Sunren. If thou rememberest aught, ere thou camest here, aught means anything. Right? If you add an N, not means nothing. So aught means anything. If you remember anything before you came here, how thou camest here thou mayst. Uh, or how you came here, please tell me. Miranda, but that I do not. I don't remember. Prospero. Twelve years since, Miranda, twelve years since thy father was the Duke of Milan and a prince of power. Prince here just means ruler. Oh, okay, so Miranda is 15. Barely three. Now, after 12 years, so Miranda is 15. Miranda, sir, are you not my father? Prospero, thy mother was a piece of virtue, so an, a very good example of a woman. And she said thou wast my daughter, and thy father was Duke of Milan, and his only heir and princess no worse issued. So he's kind of having fun. Miranda says, Aren't you my dad? And he said, well, your mother told me that you're my daughter, so I must be your dad. Uh, this also tells us that Miranda is his only child. Heir is somebody who can succeed to what you get after they die. Jitanzu. Miranda, oh, the heavens, Tiana. What foul play had we that we came from thence? What terrible thing happened to make us leave Milan and come here? Or, blessed was it we did? Or was this a good thing? Prospero, both, both, my girl. By foul play, as thou sayest, were we heaved thence, but blessedly hope hither. Hope is the past tense of help. Today we would just say helped. 
Oh, my heart bleeds to think of the teen that I have turned you to, which is from my remembrance. So I, I pity you for the trouble I have caused you because I am a young daughter and you are an only parent. Even though I don't remember from my remembrance means outside of my memory. I don't remember. Please you farther, so keep going. And the story that Prospero tells, I will leave for you to read before next week. See you next week. <laughs>